Uh, welcome, everybody, to day two uh, of the Year of Open Science Conference. We're delighted uh, that you came back and are joining us with this. This morning, uh, we are going to have a session that's focused on research assessment. All of the enthusiasm, engagement, excitement about open science, the increasing adoption has been uh, an amazing thing to witness over the last decade, but none of it will be sustainable without attention to how researchers are assessed for the quality uh, of their work. Who gets a job, who keeps a job uh, depends on research assessment. And if those don't align with the values that we have for scholarship, with the things that we're trying to advance with open science, then the basic evolutionary pressures of who gets to stick around, what the makeup of the academy of the scientific community looks like, will constantly be pushed and pressured uh, by those assessment systems. What is a rewarded and incentivized uh, for researchers to do? So this morning, we are very lucky to have three representatives of the most important movements uh, in transforming research assessment. Uh, the Declaration on Research Assessment, or DORA, Haley Hazlitt will represent that. The uh, Higher Education Leadership in Open Science, uh, Helios, represented by Caitlin Carter. Uh, and the Coalition for Advancing Research Assessment, or CORARA, uh, where Eva Mendez will represent. So what we'll do this morning is each of them will provide about five minutes of context for what uh, their assessment work is about, uh, what they're trying to do how it is trying to uh, change and reform uh, the system. Then we'll have some group discussion and we will welcome uh, conversation uh, and questions from the audience as you have them. I encourage you to use the Q&A feature, um, easier for us to monitor than the chat feature in this context. Uh, and we'll get as far as we can uh, in the 45 minutes or so that we have remaining. So let me start uh, with handing over the presentation with audio uh, to Haley Hazlitt uh, for presenting Dora. Haley. All right, thank you so much, Brian. Um, uh, Brian already gave me a, a lovely introduction. I'm Dr. Haley Hazlitt, Program Manager for the Declaration on Research Assessment, or DORA. And I want to say a really big thank you for inviting me to give really a lightning tour of what DORA is uh, and the type of work that we do uh, to implement change. Um, so, uh, the Declaration on Research Assessment, or DORA, is a global nonprofit initiative uh, of the American Society for Cell Biology, and we work to encourage best practices in the professional evaluation of researchers and the outputs of scholarly research. And we call this working towards responsible research assessment. You may have noticed the word declaration is in our name, uh, and that is because DORA is an organization that grew from a declaration of recommendations for how uh, researchers, publishers, funders, data providers, and institutions can better try uh, try to better assess research on its own merits. Uh, and now individuals and organizations can sign the declaration uh, to signal their support and commitment to reforming research assessment. And to date, nearly 25,000 uh, individuals and organizations have signed DORA across the world. Now, when you sign DORA, you're committing to several broad themes that run through the declaration. And these include the commitment to not use journal-based metrics as a surrogate measure of quality, to be explicit about the criteria used in hiring, promotion, tenure, and funding decisions, uh, and to consider the value and impact of a broad range of research outputs. And I want to note here that DORA recently celebrated its 10th anniversary, uh, and while we may have started as a declaration, um, DORA is now a global initiative that actively works and will continue to work to support and develop best practices in research assessment. Um, so, uh, how do we do this work? How do we implement change on a global scale? Uh, so DORA's approach to reforming research assessment is really threefold. Uh, we really work to engage uh, with the community and support their efforts. Uh, we work to uh, facilitate knowledge sharing and also develop resources. And um, 
We do this for all members of the scholarly community from research funders and researchers uh, and beyond. And so uh, one of the big mechanisms that we use is facilitating collective learning. So for example, uh, we host communities of practice for research funding organizations uh, and also for other initiatives like DORA so we can all uh, be in dialogue with each other and move together towards a shared goal. Uh, we host free virtual events with community members on topics relevant to them, like how uh, the pandemic impacted hiring and promotion practices, or how preprints could be leveraged for early career researchers to gain recognition for their work. Uh, because one of the biggest hurdles to organizations uh, who are working to reform their practices uh, is a lack of examples of where to start, uh, DORA has really done a lot of work to create infrastructure for the sharing of knowledge to showcase what reform looks like practically. So, for example, DORA hosts and curates a resource library. We manage a repository of case studies. Um, and this year we launched Reformscape, which is a database of openly available uh, responsible assessment practices and policies from academic institutions. And the real goal of Reformscape will be to help organizations share their work with their peers uh, and also find practical examples from their peers to help them implement change themselves. Uh, finally, DORA also develops resources to support change, and we often do this in collaboration with our uh, community members. And these can all be found in our resource library and include tools with guidance on how to implement change. Uh, and I want to just highlight that this week, our collaborators at CWTS Leiden uh, released a qualitative study of faculty hiring, promotion, and tenure assessments in the United States. And this is as part of uh, DORA's Tools to Advance Research Assessment, or TERRA, project. All right, so wrapping up my five minutes, uh, uh, I want to spend a little bit of time talking about what success might look like for DORA. What, what does success look like for DORA? Um, and we know that research assessment is very closely tied to research culture, and it's really a systems problem that impacts everyone. Solving these types of challenges requires a collaborative systems approach uh, that addresses the underlying culture, infrastructure, and conditions of the entire scholarly ecosystem. So from research funders and publishers to academic institutions, research administrators, and researchers. And DORA takes a systems approach to support change, meaning uh, that we work with all actors in this system around the world. Um, because we're a global organization that serves all members of the academic community, um, I really want to stress that success for our signatory organizations, you know, that's going to be deeply context dependent uh, based on country, organization, institution, etc. Uh, so for DORA as an organization, I think um, one benchmark of success would be would look like individuals at research institutions and funding organizations feeling supported uh, as they champion and implement more responsible research assessment practices. And ultimately, we really strive for a world where researchers are hired, promoted, and awarded funding uh, based on their most relevant work and outputs. And uh, with that, I will hand it over back to you, Brian. Thank you. Thank you very much, Haley, for that great overview. Next, we will have Caitlin Carter uh, presenting uh, about the Helios Project, Higher Education Leadership and Open Science. Caitlin. Thanks, Brian. And thanks, Haley. Um, so Helios, I think, wouldn't exist if not for the efforts of DORA. And um, we, too, are inspired by uh, Koara. So I just wanted to, to also thank Center for Open Science for inviting us to speak and um, for this wonderful event. So Helios, as Brian said, so it's the Higher Education Leadership Initiative for Open Scholarship, or Helios Open. And it's a cohort of 101 colleges and universities committed to collective action to advance open scholarship within their campus and across U.S. campuses. So it is a project that has emerged from the National Academy's Roundtable on Aligning Incentives for Open Science. Um, now it's open scholarship. We try to use an inclusive term because it's something that we have heard from a lot of our institutions and a lot of the disciplines within them that sometimes the social sciences, humanities does not feel like they, they saw themselves in this movement. So we're really happy to, to use that language to make sure that we are inclusive. 
Again, we have 101 members. Um, that covers about three and a half to four million faculty, staff, and students across the United States. We also have leading um, this effort. So Michael Crow is the president of Arizona State University. Ron Daniels is the president of Johns Hopkins University. And then our strategic lead is Gita Swamy, who is the associate vice president for research and vice president, or sorry, vice dean for scientific integrity at Duke University. Um, those two presidents, along with President Roslyn Artis and President Danny Anderson, were uh, participants in the roundtable, um, I believe, around 2019. And, and the roundtable really brought together different leaders of different industries, different sectors, professional societies, philanthropies, federal agencies, higher education. And the group saw that there really was a need for the highest level of the institution to help with what we've been shouting for the roof, from the rooftops for so long. Um, to help, you know, decision makers at the table to help us advance open scholarship norms, rewards, incentives. So they issued a dear colleagues letter um, and said, now is the time. This is a call to action. Join us in advancing open scholarship collectively across U.S. higher education. 65 institutions signed up and joined the call and said, we want to be a part of this. Um, We've grown to 101, um, which is is great. It's a lot, um, but yeah. So we we from 2022 to 2024, we surveyed our institutions and asked, you know, what do you want to work on together? And four areas emerged. You know, we asked, you know, what are your what are your measures of success if you were to join this coalition and truly advance a more equitable, transparent research ecosystem. Um, there's a group institutional departmental policy language that was the number one priority surfaced. And that really is focused on policy reform, research evaluation and assessment reform. There was another subset of institutions that really wanted to explore how open infrastructure or open scholarship infrastructure could advance some of these ideas. A third group that emerged, which was good practices in open scholarship, really focused on making open scholarship easier for researchers and the institutions that support them. And then cross-sector alignment, really staying true to the, um, you know, the, the makeup of the roundtable and seeing how that translates into this context. And it's especially important, for example, when advancing uh, reform ideas, research assessment um, change the, to, to honor some of the, the norms within, you know, professional societies and disciplines align with federal agencies and public access policies. So there's a lot of opportunities there. So our theory of change is really, you know, if we we believe that if the research incentive system rewards open scholarship explicitly, like tenure and promotion, review and hiring policies, and open scholarship is easier for researchers and the institutions that support them through alignment with those other sectors, this environment makes change easier. For us, success, truthfully, we're still figuring it out. Um, I, I don't think that we ever expected 65, now 101 institutions to answer the call. Um, that actually is, it, it's a success, but it's also a challenge. So success for us is not growing in numbers of members. Um, so when we did ask our institutions, that, that that's the approach we took. We had 65, we asked them what we thought success looked like and, and tried to um, work from there. Uh, we've learned a lot and done a lot in the last two years. So we've produced issue briefs that really make sure that leaders, um, presidents and provosts specifically know what the issues are when the Nelson Memorandum came out. Um, if anyone knows higher ed institutions, they're very um, on top of, of current events, but at the same time, some are still grappling with, for example, the NIH data management and sharing plan and, and didn't quite yet even have time to focus on the Nelson Memorandum. So we're here to inform and also educate about um, what the opportunities are to basically align our reward systems with those that are referenced in the um, public access policy with equity at its core. And in our approach moving forward, we consider, you know, three institutions working together to do something bold, like changing their tenure and promotion policies within their school as something that is a success. So sometimes, again, in, in, our, in the way that we are pivoting our work and how we've previously done our work, success is sometimes just awareness raising among the highest level of leadership. Um, knowing that they have so many priorities that pull their attention away um, and making sure that they stay engaged and see opportunities and then take that action when we need them to do that. So I'll, back to you, Brian. Thank you, Caitlin, for that great overview. Uh, our final introductory presentation will be from Eva Mendez, who will be presenting uh, the Coalition for Advancing Research Assessment. Eva. 
Thank you very much, Brian. Uh, thank you very much for the invitation. Uh, thank you, uh, NASA, for organizing the Year of Open Science. I think we are more than in the era of open science. And I'm very happy to hear my colleagues that we are on time to advance on research assessment in the, in the global spectrum of research. My name is Eva Mendez. I'm a faculty member. I'm a researcher and a meta researcher. I'm the, the head of the Open Science Lab at the University Carlos III of Madrid. But I'm also a member of the steering board of COARA that you, you may have heard about that. And people think that COARA is a European project. No, COARA is a global endeavor. It's a global initiative that is building on progress made so far for other big uh, alliances, which is DORA, Lady Manifesto, uh, Concom Principles, and all these initiatives that they have been heading before us and a common direction to uh, evaluate research in a better way and more accordingly with the right, uh, with the time that we need in pandemic and uh, challenges of climatic change. We cannot keep evaluating research as we did in 19th century when the journals have only a printer to publish them and is the, it was the only way to communicate knowledge. We all agree on this. And the initiative of Quara was creating not yet another declaration. They are more than 200 declarations all over the world in the, in the context of open science. And I always say that it's a very Spanish sentence that is a toast to the sun. We all agree on the principles. We all agree on the, we have to change the way we measure science. But so what? At the end of the day, we keep looking at H-index, we keep looking at journal impact factor, and nothing happened. So the initiative of creating Coara was in that, it was creating not yet another declaration, it was creating a community bottom up. The commission, the European Commission, was kind of our um, facilitator, but it's not a top-down initiative. Thank you, European Commission, to let us happen this and make a a community bottom up and be capable to join uh, people and institutions. The difference between Coara and Dora, Dora is 10 years old. We are only one year old. It was uh, uh, created in 2022. We create the community in December 22. So we have been just running for one year. We are just creating the structure of a bottom up community based on institutions, which is a very difficult thing to manage. But we have to distinguish between the agreement and between the coalition. People that they join the agreement, they can or cannot join the coalition. The coalition is the coalition of doers, the people that they just step forward and say, I want to change the way we measure science. With my hat in my institution, if I have a, the role of being a uh, an, an agency of evaluation, okay, good enough. But if you have the role of being just an institution, a university, or a funding agency, or whoever you are, you have to step forward and have a roadmap to change in your kingdom the research assessment. And the other thing about the community is that you have to share what you do and learning by doing with the whole community. Because this is something that really, really encourage us to do it if we do it together. We know that nobody on their own will change the way we measure science because we want to do it in a global perspective and bottom up. And the other thing is that the commitment, the commitments are similar that Dora and Helios and all these initiatives that we are exactly in the same page. We want to uh, underline that we want to recognize diversity of the contributions not paper-centric communication. We create data, we create other uh, outcomes, and we want to base the evaluation not only in one kind of contribution, as well as abandon the inappropriate use of the research assessment, journal impact factor, completely based on publication metrics, and also avoid the use of rankings. And the whole commitments, the core, the core commitments come along with commitments to share and to communicate what we do to the community. So that's why we have created uh, different, um, different uh, working groups 
based on the topics that they are crucial. And the topics that they are crucial are indicators. We cannot blame people to use journal impact factor if we don't provide them with something else. We have to agree upon together what are the new indicators that they can measure at some point in science. Also, we want to just uh, underline the value of peer review and the qualitative research, but we have to really legitimize the qualitative research because for some reason, people think that is biased. And also, we have another approach, which is the national chapters. I would love to have a national chapter for the U.S. because this is a global endeavor and we want to move forward together. But the problem is that it's a global endeavor based on institutions, not on individuals. DORA, as an individual, you can't sign DORA. You can be a member of the Research Data Alliance as an individual. But here, you have to commit your institution to do something. So we want to move forward on this uh, initiative. And the national chapters also legitimize the real boundaries that we have in the research evaluation. It's not the same that would happen in the United States. It could happen in the Netherlands or in Spain or in other countries. So we have to also communicate these uh, common endeavors with the whole world, including the global south, because we have Science is global, research evaluation should be global, and it's not only the year of open science, it's the era of open science. And we are very happy here to know that we are on time to change the bottleneck of open science, which is research assessment. You are very welcome, just join us. Thank you very much, Ava. Uh, thanks all of you for those excellent overviews uh, of your initiatives. And what is so clear just hearing them uh, back to back is how complementary they are because so much of this type of reform work requires not just a singular solution, but a, a, a co coordinated effort with many different approaches that converge on some of the shared uh, values and approaches that we're trying to accomplish. So we will transition now into some uh, open discussion among the panel. Anybody that has questions is welcome to post them into the Q&A. But what I'd like to start with uh, among the panelists is some reflection on the, how this gets started. Um, there is a, a obvious tension in any type of reform movement of trying to ask the people that can make reform to do something meaningful enough that it would make change but not have such a large ask that they can't possibly get from where they are today uh, to where they're going. So I wonder if each of you could talk a little bit about how your initiative wrestles with that tension of uh, something that creates meaningful progress, but not so far uh, that they you can't get people uh, engaged with it and how there, there's variation among these an interesting way to resolve that tension. So Haley, maybe you could start with. Uh, in the hot seat. All right. Uh, so I, I think this is a this is a really fantastic question, and um, I think that there are a few ways to to answer that um, in terms of kind of building that bottom up support or uh, making people feel like this is something that is doable. Um, we really. Uh, try to advocate for open and consistent communication um, around all issues, you know, from basic ideas around, say, the most basic, avoiding the use of journal impact factor uh, as an inappropriate metric to measure research quality, all the way up to conversations around how to iterate and expand on policies that are already in place. I think meeting people where they're at and respecting that and helping them start those conversations, because at least for Dora, um, any any movement and any advocacy is is good, and that is what grows um, grows a movement within, in this case, say an academic institution. Uh, it's one of the reasons why we accept si signatories uh, who are departments. Um, that makes up a really big base of. Uh, organizational signatories in the U.S. in particular. So if a department wants to make a change, what we'll hear, I can say anecdotally from those departments that do make those changes, is that other departments will look at them and say, oh, well, that's actually more doable than I thought it would be. So I think really supporting folks um, at whatever level they're willing to give and trying to foster them there uh, would be would be a good way to do that without setting setting the bar too high. 
Yeah. So it sounds like that is really leveraging the power of norms, peer influence of, oh, this isn't as hard as I thought it might be and sort of gaining momentum through that. That's excellent. Uh, Caitlin or Ava, do you want to elaborate on how your initiatives wrestle with this? Sure. So I'm going to, oh, Eva, do you want to go ahead? Sorry, that was my fault. Go ahead. Kim. No, no worries. Um, so I was just going in order as you described last time. So following directions. Um, yeah, so I'm going to start with success because I'm going to talk a bit about what failed and also, um, again, just kind of admire the work that Haley and Ava are, are leading. So our success or our, sorry, our approach now is awareness raising as the lowest bar for entry, but with a specific group Um and peer influence with provost, vice presidents, and uh, vice presidents for faculty affairs, which is a bit more difficult, but that group specifically. And then getting um, what we'd like to do is then get a small cohort to commit to action and reform, which is much harder. And then our role after that is to shout the successes from the rooftop so others can explore what might work for their institutions. I think that part is easier. And obviously that creates that peer influence. And so we have a very knowledgeable and robust community of almost 200 designated campus representatives who are there supporting their leaders who have been engaged for the past two years and can support um, some of those inter and intra institutional or campus activities like the ones that Haley described. So our approach at first, it did not work, but I still think it led us to a more successful place. So again, the, that number one priority was, you know, change tenure and promotion, but you got everybody in a room together and we we heard, um, I'm not the right person to be doing this advancing research assessment reform, even though I am a leader, I, um, I don't have any power on my campus. It was sort of like a diffusion of responsibility and uh, pointing fingers of like, well, if I do it as a provost, even like I'm a friendly provost and I don't want to um, do something that my faculty aren't on board with. And if it was a department chair, it was, well, I need to, um, I'm not sure the provost would support it. And so it was working through some of those uh, institutional change challenges that are happening within departments, schools, and just the institution in general. So we wrote a joint statement thinking this is easy. We will just articulate our values in higher education and how you know they pretty easily align with open scholarship. We suggested some actions campuses could take and then asked our reps to socialize them with leadership. No institutions were interested. <laughs> they said, we will not sign anything. That is um, actually more dangerous for us as leaders because then we're committing our name and our institution and our brand to something. And that's not something that we wanna do. Um, October 2022, we changed it. So we said, let's make it a little bit more flexible and say, we commit to exploring conversations or starting conversations thinking, you know what, we could just commit to exploring. That's commit to exploration. That's easy. That didn't work either. One institution, shout out to Whitman College, you had the provost um, as the designated representative only institution that signed. So we reassessed our approach and continued to learn that the specific role on campus potentially could be that VP of faculty affairs and provost hearing. It kept going up the chain. So we said, let's go ask. And so thanks to NASA, who we were collaborating with during the year of open science, like Center for Open Science is, um, they hosted a workshop uh, or funded um, a workshop through Florida International University, one of our Helios members where we collaborated. And it was specifically for presidents, provosts and vice provosts for faculty affairs and research. And 50 joined and said, we, we think this is true and we're gonna explore some action plans to basically advance research assess assessment and evaluation reform. Uh, uh, those examples are remarkable because it's so easy to presume that if one is in a leadership position, right, it's just a matter of wanting to do it. All right, I'm on board with the concepts. We're going to do this as a university. And your examples here highlight that that's, that is not that easy. Uh, you could have people that are completely on board, hearts and minds, and not, still not feel like they have the opportunity, ability, efficacy to act uh, because of how decentralized the culture uh, is and the challenges of, of bringing everyone along. So that the both of those Dora and Helios efforts of working on the leadership and bringing whoever is the coalition of the willing along sort of play that complementary building role together. It's great to hear the, the challenge as well as the, where it's moving. Uh, Ava, you want to sort of give some perspective from Cora on this issue? 
Actually, I, I completely agree with uh, with what it has been said so far, because this tension comes from that we have to maintain the system at the same time that we are creating another one. And unfortunately, we don't have money to do that. I would love to go today to bed and overnight, tomorrow, have a new completely academic system, a new complete research system where science is more de uh, dedicated to the society, to so societal uh, changes, challenges, and but it's not going to happen because we have to maintain both systems. So the tensions comes for that because uh, research is a human enterprise. We are not researchers for the 29th century that we are looking around butterflies and we have a lot of money to do that. No, we have a tenure track. We have a career involved in this. So we want to have the guarantee that we know what we have to do. Publish in the Q1. Okay, I will do it. I don't care. I do. We do whatever it is. But we have to recognize that the web have changed every single thing in our lives. The way we communicate, the way we have a boyfriend, the way we chat, the way we, we read everything except the way we communicate science, the way we found science, and the way we evaluate science. Why for? Because of this tension. Because we don't want to do this change overnight, and we have to keep the, the thing movement. It happened to me when I used to be the deputy vice president for research policies, and I have in the agenda of the day, this is super important, we have to sign CORE, we have to join this movement, blah, blah, blah. Okay, yes, wonderful, everybody agrees. And in the second point of the agenda, we have to evaluate a researcher to have this career. What is his age index? In the same conversation, in the same room. So this is the reality, and this is attention. So that's why... We in Koara, we want to have a roadmap and say, well, go as far as you can. Perhaps you cannot change overnight everything. Listen to the early career researcher. For me, this is crucial. I have a joke that everybody always has and say, under 40, there is hope. And that is true. I do really believe in the early career researchers that they are absolutely willing to share science, willing to a compromise with the society and get rid of papers. That's the whole thing. But I think the tension is there and just we have to move a little bit. Yeah, thank you for that, Eva. It's, it's such an important point that the, the principles of open scholarship are so easy to embrace, especially when one is early in the career and not jaded by the system as it currently is. And so the opportunity really is to leverage that enthusiasm engagement uh, by ECRs uh, that can then empower those that are in leadership uh, positions to actually make some uh, proactive steps uh, to support that change. So the, the comments from all three of you sort of circle around a interesting challenge of the buy-in uh, and there's variation. I don't want to get overly provincial, uh, but the, uh, the difference between U.S., level of buy-in on these, uh, and EU and even more globally, right? UNESCO has gotten substantial engagement uh, from a variety of uh, national contexts uh, on these issues. Um, do, are there unique things uh, about the U.S. context that are barriers uh, or other places that are resistant that we can look at commonalities that we might be able to start to poke at uh, to see how change can happen? And we don't have to go in any order. So anybody that has comments, welcome. Well, I, I think I can start um, from the, the global kind of um, top-down sort of view vantage point. Um, what we have found at DORA, so we can, we accept organization, as I said, we accept organizational signatories, and there's a, a very clear difference between the, the types of organizations that sign DORA, um, say, in Europe or the UK. Usually those are entire academic institutions, universities, um, as opposed to in the in the United States, we really most often see, if we're looking at academic institutions, departments or even smaller units within those departments that want to signal their support uh, for DORA, and they become signatories of DORA. And what we have heard is that it, it can because U.S. 
academic institutions are are more decentralized and departments, you know, as opposed to other other parts of the world, departments really have the say in how hiring, promotion, and tenure practices are are set out and what types of criteria are are implemented at that level. Um, And so that I think is a really big difference. And I think you know, as Caitlin said, you have to meet people where they're at and you have to find who who is the best person to talk to to implement this change. And so um, that's one of the reasons why we have our case studies, because, uh, you know, we we showcase how this change goes about. And we're, we're currently in the process of working on a case study from the U.S., our very first one. So I'm very excited about that. Um, so this is top of mind. Um but I think that would be that would be one of the biggest challenges. And just knowing that, just having that information is is really, really helpful to know to know who to talk to, as you said, Brian. Um, so that's that's my initial that's my initial thought process. And I, I think com- open communication is is just probably one of the best ways to facilitate buy in at any level. Um, yeah. Great. Thank you, Caitlin or Ava. You want to elaborate? Caitlin, please. Sure. Just, I think I, I said a bit about um, just the the reluctance to sign on to anything publicly. That's definitely a trend. Um, I, I can't. I'm not an expert as to why, but it's definitely something that um, I could make some guesses. Uh, but another thing is just the understanding, and and this also may be the case in in different countries. But um, that it, that siloed nature that Haley talked about also. Um, there are efforts that, you know, from University of Vermont after um, working with us and, and doing their own um, advocacy on campus for changing tenure and promotion, they passed a faculty senate resolution from the entire institution saying we, because we're members of Helios and open and because we are participating in the National Academies Roundtable and because the Nelson Memorandum, we want all of our schools and departments to change their tenure and promotion or change their um, policies to embed open scholarship, open science within them. And that is really wonderful. That's a huge signaling effort, but the implementation has to happen. And that's where some of the challenges and getting into the weeds of what um, doesn't work for each institution and how different institutions are across the U.S., that's where we can just really get bogged down and continuing to admire the problem or, or just, you know, we recognize that there this is an issue, but it's so hard to change in the U.S., um, at least what I'm hearing, um, because of the big differences between our institutions and then our schools, which a lot of times are, are have the autonomy to kind of do what they want and the departments. Um, that's the problem. And so, again, because we're a leadership effort, we said, let's go right to the provost and president and explore this. Thank you for that, Ava. Just to just to finish, because I'm the only one that is not not uh, um, American here, North American, um, and I think it's not a huge difference uh, because the problem is that you probably have a lot of autonomy uh, in the institution. I agree completely with Kathleen when I was in in my period of full ray scholar and in the United States. I found that you have a lot of um, a lot of uh, um, autonomy in the universities, for example, but this is perfect because this is, can produce a domino effect. Say, so, you know, uh, if MIT do something, the Stanford want to do the same. And that's what we need. Uh, it's a very big snowball that comes together because we all have the same problem. And that autonomy uh, just uh, ask for who is the bravest who can be brave enough to step forward and say, well, we will do this little tiny bit. We are going to, I don't know, change the tenure system. No, but in as a pilot, next year, we are going to use Quora principles to evaluate the fellowship of the students as postdocs. Okay, that's it. You promote the early career research in a different manner. But whatever you do is valuable. And the only thing is that you have to step forward. And it's what you said, Ryan. It's not it's no time to wait. It's no time. It's going to happen. UNESCO has a working group on how you motivate and how you uh, f- finance research. And at the end, it's a question of funding. It's a question of the golden rule. Who has the, the goal has the rule. Put the, the rule. If the NSF say you have to do this way, and they do to give you the money, people will change their mind. So that's that's the point. And also there is a crucial thing that could happen. 
that is seduction. The seduction is something that is not, is the, the best motivator of will. It's something that happened when you do it because it's easy, because it's, it's what I call the WhatsApp effect of uh, research. Do you remember when you start using WhatsApp? No, you just use it. I want to that happen and say, why I'm using now, not the journal impact factor, I'm using something else just by seduction. It's not that ne- nobody has to convince me, it's the system that convinces me. Right. Yeah, because we're already in a system and we just accept that part as it is. And we may decry it, but we don't feel powerful enough to change it. But as it evolves, we may likewise say, oh, actually, this one is more aligned with how I want uh, things to be. Great, great points, all of you. Uh, the There is a sort of an interesting uh, challenge that I think is embedded in all of your comments around inclusion, which is the obvious need to bring everybody along uh, across the academy. Caitlin raised this early in talking about the movement of language to open scholarship, to make sure that the humanities saw themselves in it. Uh, The customization or need for different departments, Haley brought up as as being an important element uh, of how it is that people see their own work themselves in all of this. But the the challenge of course, is that if it's a general movement uh, that's trying to reform assessment practices to make it as inclusive as possible then means it also has to be as custom as possible to all of those <laughs> different needs uh, across many different communities. So if there are no standards, then how does anyone figure out how they should change uh, in an effective way? And does that create a huge burden on every individual actor? Well, it's up to you. It's up to you to figure out how you want to change. Well, I, I need some tools. I need some ways to to figure out what to do. And this may also play into that challenge that uh, articulated about leaders. A provost may feel like, how could I possibly institute a new policy that's going to apply to the chemists and the poets and the business school professors? I just, I can't figure out how I would do that, even if I could. So any of you have thoughts about how that challenge of maximizing inclusion, bringing everyone along but still giving people tools and pathways to be able to make changes efficiently uh, for their own, their own domain, their own work. I can start. So I'll just say that that's been a big emphasis from the beginning. So we actually asked that question. One tactic we used was um, we uh, asked one of the original presidential signers on the initial letter that we call to action Danny Anderson, he's the president emeritus of Trinity University to work with us to have those conversations with leaders. And he really emphasized the opportunities as a provost. So he's been a, pro, he's been a dean, he's been a, pro, a faculty member, a dean, a provost, and a president. Mm. So having that experience and have that, having that peer-to-peer engagement and conversation, it lands better when it comes from him. Um, so when he's talking to presidents and provosts and vice provosts or presidents for faculty affairs, and if he says, this is an example of what's happening, you know, exerting that peer pressure, that peer influence at, you know, MIT. So Stanford, um, here are some opportunities for you as provost to do this. And so here's all these different pathways. So it's validating that it looks different, that your campus is special, but it's that peer influence that I think really in knowing how to speak the language. And he has done so much um, research in his own sort of executive coaching training to understand like, what are the, what's the complex model for change? And so he can point out like what happens when you don't do something, but as a specific leader, he talks to his peers about um, not having a reactive mindset and about the opportunities. So that's been incredibly transformative in our work. Excellent. Thank you. Haley or Ava, do you want to elaborate on any of that? All right, I'll go ahead. (laughs) Um, Yes. I, uh, I, I really think that one thing, building off of the previous conversation, and I think that this is applicable here, is um, doing a good job of showcasing when people are making that change. Because that's that's one of the biggest barriers that we have encountered is folks will say, well, I don't know where to start. I don't know what to do. Um, and if you can point to examples and getting those initial examples, that's, I think, one of the toughest 
pieces, right? Getting those really good uh, uh, practical um, cases of what change looks like. They don't have to copy it one for one, and they don't want to copy one for one what another organization does. But, you know, there is that domino effect that uh, Ava mentioned that once folks see that everyone around them is making change, then they they want to apply that in their own context. I think uh, uh, the recognition and uh, the um, uh, recognition and rewards program uh, in the Netherlands is a really great example of this. They have a very uh, flexible, um, in addition to Quora, of course, but the, the recognition and rewards program has been around for several years, and they have a really flexible set of guidelines that are being implemented across the country. And they have all of these different examples of how these guidelines are implemented in a way that is unique to each department or school, but still falls within that umbrella. So it's really the balance of not being overly prescriptive while also being, you know, having firm enough guidelines that people can build off of. Um, but I think the flexibility is really important. Mm -hmm. And, you know, uh, just allowing people to make changes that work best for them because good doesn't look the same uh, from institution to institution mm -hmm. or, you know, what is valued is very different from country to country or region to region. So we can't be too prescriptive with that, but therein lies the challenge. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, Haler. Ava, any final comment on that? I do. I do really agree. So on behalf of the time, I will just uh, tell you that if there is a burning question in the in the Q&A, because I completely agree with you. Uh, and, and also, Quara has a, a, um, a places in order to share action plans that you can look for that and I can share the link afterwards. I think it's in my slides. So this is the exactly what it, what it happened. Excellent. Thank you, Ava. Well, we are uh, at the within the minute of the, our time period. So I will use this as an occasion to wrap. We're really just scratching the surface uh, of research assessment uh, and how to do it. But what's clear is that it's a it's a ground game. Uh, a lot of this is working person by person, institution by institution, program by program to try to build energy around these issues and advance experimentation uh, and make visible those things that are working to share knowledge uh, so that the change can spread. Uh, both uh, Jenny and Paul in the in the Q and A offered other pathways that I think are are worth everybody thinking about when they're thinking about change for research assessment. And I think they're very resonant with the discussion uh, that we had. Uh, Jenny, for example, noting uh, that well, departments may be the locus of change because the norms of scholarship are within scholarly disciplines rather than across an institution. So maybe societies, uh, scientific societies are a great partner uh, for departments in disseminating those changes uh, across scholarly domains. Uh, and then Paul uh, offered uh, that, you know, at, you know, maybe you just go even go down a level. Uh, individual faculty or groups uh, may be ones that can enact change more effectively at the outset and then build capacity uh, across programs from there. I think both of those are very resonant with all the comments uh, that you made. So thank you, uh, everyone, for coming uh, to this session. Uh, thank you, Haley, Ava, and Caitlin uh, for presenting the work and just for the work that you're doing. Uh, this is uh, a critical part of scaling and sustaining uh, the open scholarship movement uh, to advance transparency, equity, uh, and uh, reproducibility as, uh, as the aims are of the, global, of, of the global work. So thank you everyone for uh, attending this session and enjoy uh, the rest of the meeting.